how science works is a key component of the Key Stage 3 science curriculum. In this series, we profile the work of three scientists. Clive Oppenheimer, a volcanologist whose work takes him around the world. Catherine Bottrell, an energy and climate change researcher working closely with the UK music industry. And Kerry Harrop, a biochemist specialising in respiratory medicine working with future Olympians. As well as the programmes, there are new innovative curriculum materials that have been developed to be integrated with the How Science Works programmes and additional CPD material, all available on the Teachers TV website. At Sacred Heart High School in Hammersmith, Stuart Murphy will be taking his Year 8 Science class through the first lesson in the scheme. These new lessons have been developed around an e-model of learning, with scientific inquiry as its basis. The lessons are divided up into stages, which cover all the important learning functions. Lesson objectives are not displayed at the start, but through inquiry are drawn out naturally during the course of the lesson. I like the fact that you go from beginning to end, it's got quite a natural flow to it. And it's, for, my, for me anyway, I find it's quite easy to teach. It's not, it's not ungainly, it's not unusual, it doesn't feel uncomfortable. It just makes sure you're doing the things that you wanted to do in every lesson anyway. Just the lesson is about breathing and links in with the How Science Works Asthma on the Run program. The Engage section is designed to grab the students' attention and introduce them to the objective of the lesson. Have we got any asthmatics in the room? One. How long have you been asthmatic? Since I was a baby. Can you explain to people what an asthma attack is like? It feels like your lungs are tightening and closing and you keep gasping for air. So it makes it really hard to breathe, right? Yeah. So we're going to have a look at the video clip. We're going to look at this athlete and see... Um, he wants to be in the Olympics, so he actually wants to be, like, the best in the world, not just average, and also to a scientist who's working with him to find out a bit more about his lungs. This opening clip sets up the central theme of the lesson, whether an asthmatic athlete could win an Olympic gold. A show of hands reveals that most of the students don't fancy his chances. Take two minutes, groups of three preferably, and try and come up with an idea of why do you think he can't win an Olympic gold medal? So your heart is pumping faster, but with someone who has asthma, they can't like breathe yeah, as well. He hasn't got enough oxygen, and when you run, your heart beats faster. If you're a person with asthma, you're going to lack energy because you can't really breathe as much. So we think you can try to win a gold medal, but he's going to have a disadvantage compared to the other people that he's running with. Maddie. I like seeing as it's around the summertime and stuff, uh, it, and it could the global warming. It's getting hotter. Yeah. So it could be a humid day, seeing as it is in the future. If you get the kids engaged from the very beginning, then they're, they're into the lesson and they want to learn and they want to find out what it is you're trying to tell them. And that makes a massive difference when you do take the time to do it. The illicit stage is used to find out students' existing ideas, including any misconceptions. For this lesson, Stuart is going to put four volunteers through their paces as the class consider what happens to their breathing during exercise. OK, thanks, Susan. Thanks, Giovanna. Lucy, brilliant. Anika, fantastic. Let's get outside. Anika's asthma is not serious, and Stuart has checked that all the volunteers were able to take part in physical activity. Stuart is going to measure the volunteers' blood oxygen levels before and after a minute's exercise. So, Susan, we've got oxygen of 99% and a really low heart rate. 88. Is that good or bad? Totally cool, ready for the challenge. <laughs> Benika is pretty fit and healthy. 99% oxygen, but her heart rate is 106. Giovanna is 99% oxygen, and her heart rate is 94 at the moment. Lucy, your oxygen is... There you go, it's measured it up, 99% as well. But your pulse rate is 102. The rest of the students will also be counting how many breaths each volunteer takes in a minute. Ready, set, go. Go on! Girls, watch their breathing. You can't see the breathing! Okay, girls, stop. 
<laughs> They're all pretty puffed out. We're going to see if anything's changed. They've had a bit of time to relax. As you'd expect, heart rate has increased after exercise, but interestingly, blood oxygen levels have remained the same. No matter what happens, OK, the level of oxygen in their blood didn't change. So they worked really, really hard, right? They used up lots of oxygen, but nothing changed. Back in the classroom, the groups consider the findings from outside. What ideas have you got? Any ideas? Well, we said that because, like, your muscles, you need more oxygen to have more energy. So you would need to breathe more quickly to sustain the amount of oxygen that you need to carry on the energy that you're using. OK, so you just it's about needing more. Yeah. So you've got to get more in because you need more. Getting responses from them, so eliciting information from them. It's important to just to find out what they know as much as anything else, to find you know to give you a baseline to work on. And I think it's surprising when you use the model how many times or you get an answer that you weren't expecting. In the explore stage, students get the opportunity to carry out some further tests on their lungs. Was it easy to measure breathing when people were exercised? Uh, no, it's pretty tough. We've got two pieces of equipment I'm going to show you. The first one is this. This is called a peak flow meter. Right, and what it does is it measures the hardest you can breathe out. So a really big I'm not going to do it because I'll spit all over you. But the, the hardest you can breathe out, like right? one big puff, straight out. And it will measure, it will work out from that how many litres of air you can actually get out of your lungs in a minute. Now, the other thing, this is great, this. Look. <laughs> there we go. Let's hold as well as using peak flow metres, the students will also use a lung volume bag to measure their total lung capacity. Finally, they measure each volunteer's height and enter all of the readings into a spreadsheet. That is one metre, 53 and a half. The preparation for a lesson, like the one that I did today, is, it is a little bit more extensive than usual, I think. And there is more to do. The big advantage, I suppose, being that once you've done it, it's done. So you don't have to go back and do it again. But there is a little bit more in terms of you've got to have all the resources ready. Some of the resources that we use today are things we've never used before. But, you know, that in itself leads to quite a bit of preparation. The flip side is that the, the PowerPoint is done. So, you know, the structure is there, the video clips are there. If we look at this one, We've got lung volume versus height. Does anyone think there's a pattern there? Sorry. The smaller the height, the smaller the lung volume, like in some of like with some of the people. But yeah. then so I think if you have a small height then it's the smaller the lung volume because you okay. make small lungs. So maybe if you've got small height, small lung volume means you've got small lungs. Yeah. Okay, that's an interesting idea. Um, we'll have a look at peak flow as well now. See if there's anything else there. Have a look at that. What do you think? Again, it looks like the higher, the taller you are, the higher your lung flow is. But then in the middle again, you're middle height and it, you're the highest peak flow. So. so it's all around the middle heights. It does vary a bit. Yeah. But you've got some of the taller people at one end and some of the lower, smaller people yeah. at the other end. Yeah, I think that's pretty reasonable. In the explain stage, Stuart builds on the previous ideas using the second part of the video, which shows a spirometry test. This is a more complex version of the tests the students have just carried out. It also shows how data obtained from tests like these can be used in a real-life situation. For me, it's all about seeing science in reality, in real-life situations, and probably today's lesson was a perfect example of that. A real person, a real scientist, real data, real information. And, you know, for the pupils, it's, that's what they're seeing. They're seeing the real world and how science fits into the world that surrounds them. The elaborate stage helps students apply their knowledge to another context. The third section of the video goes into much greater depth about how the lungs work and the importance of medication for somebody like Wayne. When we seen the lungs, it was all right, but it was a bit disgusting. I liked the bit when they dissected the lungs because it showed how the lungs work. I didn't really expect like the colour of them or anything because they were a bit 
red and well I was expecting them to be red but they were more thick than I thought they were going to be. Although some of the students are a bit squeamish the lung dissection has clearly got them thinking further about asthma. Um, so, because my friend has asthma, but she, when we went away, she had like different colours of the thing. Oh, inhaler. But yeah. why is it? How come some people have different colours? Uh, there's different types of medication, so like they can do the same job, but some of them um, are just different chemicals. Oh. So some people might have, be better off having one, like some children take one and some adults take another. But like she said, she's, there's one that you take all the time, but then there are others to take for when you're actually having an asthma attack to try and stop it, to try and make the airways get bigger. Aren't some of them stronger than others? So yeah. if you've got really severe asthma, you can... Absolutely. So I don't know what the colours mean, but you get different colours for different things. Pascal knows what the colours mean. Aren't the blue ones if you're having an asthma attack at the moment, and then the brown ones are the, the long term, um, that aren't as strong, and then the white ones with the red at the bottom are the strongest ones. Is that right? OK, that sounds reasonable to me. <laughs> My dad used to have asthma, and he doesn't have it anymore. Can you get rid of it, or does it um, just go away? It depends how bad it was in the first place. Okay, um, it may have been something that caused his asthma because some people have asthma when they're younger and it's to do with where they live and things like that. Like pollution can cause asthma in a lot of people or at least it can show it up so that you've got to have an inhaler. So some people have them at certain times, like maybe when they're growing up because their body's changing, everything's growing, they can have different problems. But then it, sometimes you just don't need one anymore, but maybe he doesn't run like he used to, I don't know. The evaluate section is designed to test how the student's understanding is progressing. In this lesson, it takes place in two sections. Firstly, the students play a true or false game to test their knowledge. Cells release energy from glucose and water. False. Right, glucose and oxygen. And finally, Stuart asks the students to consider how they'd explain what they've learnt to a younger audience. OK, Emma, what have you got? Asthma is when you have difficulties in breathing. This happens when a part of your lungs becomes clogged up with mucus and slows down the process of gas exchange, making it harder to breathe. Today you can use medication to help stop this. You can use an asthma pump which helps to break down all the clogged up mucus and makes it much easier to breathe. Fantastic. Wouldn't you feel better if you got a letter like that? Yeah. Yeah, I think I'd feel a lot better. So, girls, um, what's the key? The one key thing, if you're asthmatic, what should you be doing? Pascal? You could take your inhaler. Right, perfect. I liked how they showed real-life situations because he actually wanted to be an, um, an athlete in the Olympics. I liked the way that we didn't just focus on just about lungs. We learned about like the different causes that can happen with your lungs. Like We learned about asthma that affects your lungs as well. I liked it that I could find out about like me instead of just everyone else, like instead of reading it out of a book. My best lessons looked like this before. Um, now with this scheme, my, all my lessons follow the same pattern, so I, I feel that all my lessons are better. It sort of it's, it's raised the standard across the board.